Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining the OECS team for today's webinar, Building a Strong Safety Culture. We're really excited to uh, share with you what we've learned as a company on this topic. And um, so we can move things ahead here. Let's see now, Mark, we'll make sure we got things going. There we go. Here's the three folks. Melissa's joined us from Fargo. Tim and I are here in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. And if you want to take a picture of that screen, not for the uh, visual part of it, but for the contact information, you may find yourself moved to reach out to any one of us for more information. And of course, along the way, we're gonna encourage you to uh, uh, send an email to myself if you'd like a free copy of the book that covers this whole topic in detail. Uh, it's filled with great stories. It's written for folks like us who want things distilled down in simple form. It's 100 plus pages. It's an easy read. It's really been well received by our clients. And we want to share that with you if you don't have a copy. So by all means, reach out to us. If you missed it, we'll go through that screen again at the end, or you can send uh, a chat message. So our mission is to inspire strong safety cultures to keep employees returning home safe. And that's why we do these webinars to share them with the hundreds of clients that we have across a lot of the upper Midwest and beyond. And so we we put this one together because some things have kind of hit home, really hit home for us as we've looked at some recent data. And if you know what this number represents, please put it in the uh, chat box because we'd like to know if if you know what the 5,190 represents. And as you think about it, if you don't know, that's okay. But if you do know, that means that you know maybe you're paying attention and this information that came out as recent here as uh, just this past December about how the U.S. is doing in the workplace with fatalities. And what really got us is that there's usually a lag on the reporting because it takes months for the government to assemble all the data. But what really hit home for us as a team here at OECS, you know, we've been in business for 30 years working with many clients on safety, is that it really hasn't improved. And we started to think about, you know, why is that? What, what's getting in the way of as a country, us not improving, actually lowering the number. And in fact, if you look at the last 10 years, we, we haven't reduced this number. It's been, you know, darn near over 5,000 for 10 plus years. So we started to ask ourselves some questions, you know, why is that? And not from putting on a lens of uh, let's go in and, and, and do an investigation on what happened to some of these 5,100 and 90 folks, but let's let's see if we can humanize this more because you know you read the studies often if it's a big number it just doesn't really resonate with us. So we wanted to understand more about who are they like what happened you know how did it happen um, why did it happen asking some of these questions and again not in the perspective of let's do an investigation but let's look around in our own backyard and and frankly folks uh, for those of you participating and we thank you for taking time out of your busy day to do so we were quite surprised um, when we started to dig in and, and humanize this and look at some of the stories. Tim, here's one from Cloquet, Minnesota, and you've got background on, on mines and whatnot. Tell us a little bit about what your insight is. You know, the tough part is we always don't get all the details until OSHA really closes things out. But the thing that caught me off guard on this one here and really brought it to attention of, of a culture thing is this individual uh, was was working alone. Uh, and that happens often in industry and we don't think about checking on them. And as uh, you read the report down there, it says, while there were other workers in the general area, they, the victim was alone at the time of the incident. And so looking as a team effort, working towards that culture to make sure that we all work and we watch each other for the safety side was really the big factor in this one that it, probably could have been prevented or maybe reduced to an injury versus a fatality. So, you know, we put a number up there, number one story that we came across in the upper right-hand corner, and we started to dig in a little further. Not didn't have to go far right here in our own backyard in the Twin Cities. And we heard about this in the news, and two workers were killed in a trench, you know, two. So we're up to three, and we're not trying hard. It's just a simple search, boom, the stories come, come up. The other thing on this factor is you see in the in the picture a trench box and uh, with some investigation and stuff, this box was being used. However, it was taken out because they were going to do the backfill and something occurred and they went back into the trench without the box. And that's the thing you look at is do we take shortcuts 
do we take that safety out of that element at the very last minute? We protect it. And when you looked at the numbers here, the cave-in factor, 70% of the fatalities occur because of the cave-ins. And so it's a huge thing that we put ourselves in harm's way. And as we get into the safety culture later, we're going to talk about this team and this work effort of not allowing coworkers to take shortcuts. You know, one thing you may look at this and say, well, hey, my my company, we don't have anything to do with uh, trenching excavation. And the thing that we want to instill as we talk more about the five C's is uh, the impact on people. So it, it doesn't matter what kind of injury you have, uh, particularly a fatality, but the ripple effect in your company, with their family, with the community is huge. And Melissa, you know, this one was in uh, North Dakota. You've got some experience and knowledge of what can happen in the oil fields. Tell us a little bit more about your thoughts on this. Yeah, thank you. So the last few years, we've heard quite a few stories coming out of the oil field. Um, many of them um, in that, you know, capacity of these individuals possibly don't have the knowledge uh, they need to be performing the tasks. What was a little bit, um, you know, enlightening for this particular story is that the deputy noted in the report that she did not see any crew members wearing any high visible H2S monitors. Um, so nothing's being sampled or monitored uh, on that particular site. And if it would have been, this gentleman possibly wouldn't have had to lose his life if the company would have been doing what they need to to protect him and everyone else on that particular site. We've heard quite a few things come out of the oil field. Um, and unfortunately, they they land in this category where we're talking about our number four fatality just in our backyard. So you can think about you know the five C's the first C being around commitment, then around you know building uh, the the uh, the culture. There's another piece around compliance. There's other pieces around having the champions. And we're going to go through all that, but you can just see a gap here when you're not even in compliance. You set up your company and your people at a high risk, and outcomes like this are devastating. And I tell you, we've had a number of leaders who have experienced situations like this on their watch, and they never forget it. And here's another one in, in Sioux Falls that just recently happened. Yeah, we've been as a team trying to get a little bit more information on this. It's a relatively newer investigation. So they're still under, um, you know, some uh, that investigation piece. But if you think about everything that we've looked at, when we get the report back, chances are it's going to lead to some of that complacency, non-training. Uh, where did the company possibly fail this individual? What did the person not know or understand? You got it. So, you know, stories like this, again, we, we were in our own backyard, so to speak. A lot of you we know are from the upper Midwest, work with companies in the upper Midwest. Tim, when you read the story, what comes to mind? There's a lot of unsafe acts that were allowed to continue. Um, we all know that we don't ride in bucket trucks uh, of, of, a, of a skid loader. Uh, that's just not not even allowed and not even smart to do on that part of it. So there was a lot of complacency, uh, accepting the way it is and not, not pushing it. The other factor is when he when they did hit the bump and they and they did and that lanyard did get caught under the wheel. I mean, there was nothing that guy could do besides, as I said, get pulled out of the bucket and ran over. So. When we again go back to the culture part of it is not allowing your coworkers to uh, perform unsafe acts and not closing a blind eye to it, not saying, geez, it's not my job, let somebody else handle that. It's this team effort and having your value and your input really, really important. Can you imagine being the coworker yeah. operating the equipment alongside them and yeah. what go that what they go through and then the individual's family and and everyone else involved and um, this is another example that this is one of the OSHA top 10. This is a big one. Uh, Tim, you've got some experience in this well, area. I lived in Duluth for several years and worked in with in the safety side and got to do some of the shipping industry. And obviously, this is where they they uh, they do their annual inspections and they refurbish the, the Lakers and the big boats and stuff. And fall protection, obviously, is a huge factor. And falling 50 feet into that uh, pit area um, you know, it, it's just not excusable and having fall protection and training, but not only that, but having that follow through to not allow them in that area without the fall protection is the other issue. Because as again, as we get to 
the, the next slide, fall protection is another leading cause of fatalities. And it's something that we've all been trained on, but is it enforced yeah. and is it reinforced on a day-to-day -day basis? Melissa, you, you've got some experience with this. Just so everybody knows, you, you know, you might go, hey, our company doesn't work on huge liners on Lake Superior, but here you go. Right. And I think it's... Um... We get to see this every year, fall protection and fall citations is always in the top 10 for OSHA violations. It's not just in construction. We're seeing this uh, on the general industry side as well. And they don't always lead to just a minor injury from a fall. We do see a lot of these that they are fatalities and they are preventable. Absolutely. And I, I just got to tell you, as we were looking into this, this caught my attention and I almost, you know, Caterpillar, huge company. We know there's a big commitment to safety. I saw this and and I couldn't believe what I was reading about a worker dying from falling into a pot of molten iron twice as hot as lava. Uh, a couple things come out in this story. Tim, you pointed those out when we looked at this earlier. Now, one of the big things is um, this 39-year-old employee it was on his ninth day of the job, you know, nine days into a new job. And where was, you know, the gaps or where was the mentoring or the follow through as that team culture of things? And, and it's always tough to look back, but you look at it and say, are we putting you know, people in a situation as a new hire without the support, the leadership, the mentoring? How are they being trained? Are they trained by example stuff? You know, there was another fatality years ago in a very, very well-known company where it was the employee's first day and he uh, was put in a situation where he lost his life. So that new hire orientation, training and mentoring ship is really, really important. It's huge. And, you know, OSHA went on to say in this one, if the safety guards for fall protection had been installed, this, this could have been avoided. And again, this is on leadership. That's why in the five C's, we start with the commitment from the top. We really believe strongly that that's where that sets the tone. And, um, you know, here's another example, uh, one down in Iowa. Uh, Tim, you and I were talking about this. What struck you about this story? Well, again, you look at that um, being pinned uh, against equipment. Was it a lack of communication? Was it a lack of training as far as visibility and understanding where the equipment is? Uh, because there's always blind spots, but if things are set up in advance so we know how we communicate, how we're going to be visible or not visible in certain areas, things like this shouldn't happen. And that's the whole idea behind is pre-con meetings, educational meetings to, to lem eliminate these types of hazards. A lot of communication. I've had people say, hey, I, I, I like the five C's framework. It resonates with me. It makes sense. But if I were to suggest adding a six, it would be communication. communication. Communication weaves throughout all the other five, for sure. Melissa, here's one uh, back to Fargo. Tell us a little bit about this. Yeah, this hit our team uh, pretty hard. This just happened in January, so it's pretty newer. Um, but when our team looked at this, we just came back to a 29-year-old employee that possibly didn't understand the capacity you know, going into a trailer, trying to figure out um, some shifted inventory and fix that. And when he was trying to, the pallet tipped over and crushed him. And I think what we often miss as when we're onboarding someone, especially if we're living in the Midwest, we maybe assume that everybody has experience with working with equipment, right? Everyone should know how to operate a forklift. We live in the upper Midwest. Well, not everybody has that, or the employee might express that they have had that experience working somewhere else, but every situation they're in are going to have different risks and hazards. So what kind of training did this person um, undergo uh, during his onboarding? We don't know, right? We only get what we can, what we're given in um, this article. But again, training up front, being more pro proactive, communicating that this person could have left huge. that trailer and yeah. walked out and got some help uh, are huge. And should, you know, how many of you out there listening today uh, work in an organization or have in the past where a forklift was involved? And many of you have. So this is a never ending challenge. And so one of the things that we wanted to highlight for you in this conversation is we, you know, after 10, it became clear that of the 5,190, uh, there's a lot of these right in our own backyard. And we want to learn from these. 
and share with you again how the five C's of building a strong safety culture book can help uh, allevi alleviate some of this pain and suffering that goes on in people's lives. And we want to give it to you for free. If it helps avoid an injury, your company or save somebody's life, hey, more power to us all. And the thing about this that we highlighted is this ripple effect. We have been told so many times from folks that we work with, we've been in business for 30 years, so we've heard a lot of stories. A lot of You've stories. seen a lot. And people will go on to say, you have no idea the impact it has when we lose somebody to any loss of life, and particularly what's in the workplace. Uh, we just want to underscore that, that everybody understands the gravity of what's going on. And what we're seeing in the market is this is a never-ending challenge. And big companies, as well as some of the small, maybe we highlighted earlier, face this. And this is a story, Dollar General, you know, they've got $15 million in fines uh, across many of their locations in the Southeast. And, and this is a real gap because, you know, you would think that in these larger organizations, leadership's got a clear visibility to a safety plan. So we're all guilty of it, regardless of size. And many of us have seen the headlines with Amazon. Now there's six warehouses where OSHA is after Amazon to get them in compliance. But we think, hey, after hearing all of that about the fatality side, there's a lot of hope. And um, there's a lot of hope because there's great leadership on this call today. There's great leadership. Many companies, hundreds of them across the upper Midwest showing people how to do it and do it right. And that's what I've been talking to you about here is we want to share this information with you. And just to review quickly, well, what are the five C's? What are you guys talking about? Again, you'll see this circle throughout the next coming stories, but um, it's about commitment. It starts at the top. The compliance piece, you can't skip over the foundation. We're really big on, you know, heck, it's in our name, OECS. But compliance is the foundational piece that enables the strong culture building to follow. And that's the third C that we talk about. And we've also learned through the years that you don't go anywhere unless you have real champions in the team. And we'll talk about a platform called the safety committee. That is where the champions can play, be heard. But it, this isn't about quantity. This is about quality. If you have a handful of the right people committed, it can make all the difference in the world. And as you learn and get really good at the things that are above, hey, guess what? As a business, we absolutely need to be more efficient and have our costs in line. And there's huge benefits with safety investment. We wanted to share with you some of the um, recent OECS uh, safety award winners uh, for the year 2022. We just announced the winners here in January. And wow, we really realized that when we looked at the pinnacle and spotlight champion and teamwork awards, that these folks uh, were teaching us some neat lessons on safety, that these were some stories that we should share with you on the webinar today about how they're impacting uh, the five C's of of safety here in the workplace today. And we wanted to start with commitment with leadership and the motivation it takes to really lead the safety effort. Tim, tell us a little bit about SCR. Thanks a lot of refrigeration, <clears throat> commitment. The uh, gentleman holding it, uh, the award is a CFO, financial officer, pretty much at the top of the pile as far as that uh, leadership level goes. But his showing the level of commitment to each and every one of his leaders, as well as his employees, has shown through to the point where not only do they ask for their input, but they follow through and, and help them complete what they're asking for. They also have a big commitment of attitude saying, hey, if you feel it's unsafe, don't do it. If you feel there's an unsafe condition, let's talk about it and correct it so that it doesn't put you in a, in a situation of an injury. That's that level of commitment from the top that says there is nothing more important. And we see all the banners and signs of safety first and stuff. But this company won this award because they believe it and they live it each and every day. And shout out to Bob for really doing yep. great work and partnering with him. And I think one thing I'd underscore that uh, Tim highlighted, when you get into the first sea of commitment is the listening. They're really listening. Um, a lot of us, me included at times, we're not good listeners. The more you listen, the more insight you're going to get. If you got a camera, you can take a screenshot. Um, we can get you this as well. But this is a simple uh, survey we have people take. You can take it about yourself. We'd say start with yourself. You can do it about your company. You can share with the team. But these are the 10 factors of safety that we have really found that differentiate great leadership and safety from bad. And uh, Tim, you've got some experience with groups with this. We've done several seminars, and the, the, the response they get out of a few of these 
are remarkable. For instance, the commitment. Are you a great leader? It's it's real. You can see it. Or are you on that right side where it's just lip service? You know, that's the other factor that we look at. And as we talked about some of the, the fatalities and stuff, it goes back to the training portion of it. Are, do we train on a regular basis or we train when we have time and if it just pushed off, it just pushed off. This is where that commitment goes back to where some of these incidences can be eliminated and prevented. But the other big part is accountability. Do we hold the people accountable or are we saying, hey, that's Joe, he's been here for 30 years, we're not going to do nothing. And we allow unsafe practices like some of the fatalities that we've witnessed. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, if you as you overlay this with this, the first 10 stories we heard yeah, at the beginning, uh, Tim and Melissa, and then you think about our award winners, the difference. I mean, there's so much red blinking in those stories we heard earlier where it can be any one of these 10. And whereas we find this folks that are, are really stepping up in safety, they're in that green zone more often than not. They're not perfect. But they're but they're getting there, and if I think you, that's great. If you great. took a picture of that, please be honest with yourself because that's the only way you're going to improve. Absolutely. So one of the folks, uh, one of the companies, you know, that we really thought was doing a nice job setting the foundation and won an award for it. I'll let Melissa tell the story. Awesome. Yeah, this is Rapid Corporation. They received our top, our pinnacle award, which means they're kind of hitting all the spokes on our five C's. But we've looked at the compliance piece because really they do have the leadership commitment. Um, and when you look at what is compliance, it's working with a team. So they don't just do it alone. Um, they have incorporated their team, their safety committee, their leadership is 100% bought in, they're on board. Um, but what I really enjoyed about the hearing of the story is that their leadership team is invo involved in all their safety activities. So they're supportive in creating the culture and the team sees that that they're out there, they're in the trenches, they're out in the shop, that they're not like hidden behind a wall. They're very um, encouraging. They are very proactive. And that shows from, you can see in the photo, a clean shop, a communications board, uh, which leads to the next slide, that they're always ready. Like their compliance is spot on. If OSHA shows up there, they're not gonna um, have to worry. They're not gonna spin out of control wondering, what don't they have in place? They already have that in, in place. That compliance piece and all their other five C's are working together. So they're not gonna, uh, again, they're not gonna worry you if OSHA comes knocking at their door, they're gonna be ready to show them what they have in place and they get to move to the next, the next step. One of the things too that uh, we've talked a lot about, <clears throat> thanks Melissa on that, is foundationally really solid company and that enables so many of the other five C's to work. And maybe you're not there yet, you know, maybe you're not in compliance because we work with, you know, clients who are starting in all different places. But, you know, as you start to do the journey up that safety mountain, you get yourself in compliance, you know, what that enables, as Melissa describes, is you can start tackling that culture, you know, and that culture, as we look at it, that's your DNA. Um, that's who you are as a company. And uh, Melissa, tell us a little bit more about these folks. Awesome. Yeah, I had the privilege to go to this award, uh, Teamwork Award to Enclave Companies in Fargo. And what I really enjoyed to learn from their team was that a few years ago, they had identified some gaps in their safety program and they wanted to make a change as they were growing. And in doing that, they set a foundation. They incorporated monthly training. They don't skip. Uh, they have a safety committee that's very active. They take their audits, they share them as a team, but then what's expected is that their people that come to the training, they're their relay to the crew of everything they learned. So they get that culture, they've established it from the beginning, they hold people accountable, they don't want to slip down a slippery slope, because uh, that's where they've been, and they don't want to go back there. Now they're seeing great work, great success, and it was really exciting. Um, they didn't know they were getting the award that day, and all of these people were there for their meeting. This is how many employees they have every month. And this is their, their leadership, their project managers, and they go back and work with their crews uh, to incorporate safety. That's awesome. So really a nice, you know, back to what C are we on here? We talked about commitment from leadership. We talked about examples around foundation. Here we are talking about culture. I love the engagement, Melissa, the number of people they have engaged. And, you know, one of the things that we talk about in the book, and you can read it in detail for free, or you can go on Amazon and pay for it. Um, but the culture defined is really, it's like electricity. People say, well, what is this culture thing? You know, how do I understand how to shape it and improve it and strengthen it? 
it's it's an invisible thing yet it's controlled and transferred and I, what i like about the story we just heard is the transferring of that knowledge the reinforcement of how important safety is to this organization so that's really good um i'm going to share with you some more slides here before i turn it back over to um tim on the next one but just to give you some background one of the things we talk about we hear a lot about this in fact we were just meeting earlier this week tim o'connor and i with a company that we're going to be doing some work with and you know they actually have done pretty good with their safety but they said you know what um we're we're getting this that we're getting a little we're losing our edge and one of the things that i i respect uh nick saban a ton i love sports and and you can bet that they'll be back in the playoffs next season um, he talks about complacency. There's three things we can't have. And complacency and safety is probably the most dangerous thing. A lot of you out there may be looking at a safety record that's stellar, hasn't had an issue 5, 10, maybe 20 years, hundreds of days, thousands of days. But that complacency is your biggest uh, boogeyman that you got to tackle. And so part of culture, the way you can address it is head on, is if you can strengthen the culture, you can reduce the odds of having complacency. So in the book, it'll talk about you know, how many employees are really engaged at work? And there's a series of questions that Gallup answers or asks folks across many different industries. Anyway, when you dig into it and you dig into the questions, when you get really high scores, strong scores, strong positive scores on these questions, what they're finding through their research is you can have 70% fewer safety incidents. And I, I'm just highlighting the three questions out of the 12 that are the biggest movers. It's simple things like I have the materials and equipment I need to do my work right. You can look this up again. It's in the book. It's on the website. Um, if you have the simple things like I got the things, the PPE and the other parts of this puzzle I need, you're reducing the chance of safety issues right off the bat. The other thing, and we highlighted this with uh, St. Cloud Refrigeration, sure. my opinion counts. Well, you can't understand what opinions people may have unless you ask them and then you listen. And we have found this time and time again that folks who are moving the dial on their safety culture is uh, they're making progress on listening and actually weighing those opinions and doing something about it. Last but not least, when it comes to a really strong cultural building, the thing you got to look at is somebody's talking to the folks doing the work on a fairly frequent basis to see how they're doing and they know where they stand. If they're not getting any feedback on how they're doing performance-wise, inclusive of safety, then they don't know if they're doing a good job or a bad job, and that leads to problems too. So you'll find and learn more about that in the book, and we encourage you to do so. Um, and one of the things that we wanted to make sure we took time to do here, because we're, we're going to go here for about another 20 minutes, is talking about safety champions. And um, there's so many great examples we have with clients. Tim, tell us about this group. Well, this is Phyllis Distilling up in Princeton, and they won our team award, uh, and this is their safety committee. But what makes it unique is they've actually renamed it. They call it the Ranger Dangers, and they're looking at a team to improve. And everybody on this team brings a different aspect to safety because they're from different departments, different job functions, and they they listen to the workers, and they bring those issues as a open forum to discuss and come up with solutions so that they can be eliminated. Uh, this team is headed by Carrie. Uh, she is the linkpin, the, the, the positive force that really doesn't allow it to slide through the cracks. Again, they meet on a regular basis. It's, it's a consistency and it gets the support of the leadership. The leadership on this and this organization supports this team effort, this committee to the fullest level. To the point where I've seen emails come back and forth to them and said, I'm really proud to work for an organization that the safety and the committee is a core value. It's not a priority. It's a core value. It doesn't change. And Tim can talk about the difference of the priorities and core values in that part. That's awesome. A shout out to Danny Hoffman and the group there. And Tim, I see your picture back there. Was that photoshopped in? That's you. Yeah, they snuck me on this. That's yeah. awesome. They've done great work. We're really proud of them. And, and, you know, the safety committee, you brought this up. Now, we know a lot of our organizations that we work with, some of you are coming through an association that we partnered with. You may or may not have a safety committee in place, or maybe it is in place, which is common and there's just not a lot going on tell us the importance of this and what's got to happen you know that commitment of having it active uh having it take place place on a regular basis 
allows everything to flow because they're really the liaison between the workers and, and the management team at times. And so that management commitment is crucial to give them the time to do their jobs that they need to do within the safety side to make sure they understand not only the standards, but how to document and keep that organization and the membership involved. But the biggest thing is planning and accountability. That committee holds their associates, their coworkers accountable. Uh, they, they just don't, it's just not a fluff in a, in a surface mode. It's really truly an accountability and that makes it a really successful group. So one of the things that we've learned folks who are participating with us today and who will watch the recording is, you know, the odds are to be successful at building a strong safety culture, you need to have a, a really good safety committee in place. We have very few organizations that are succeeding at safety that don't utilize this platform and this solution. One of the other things that we've learned over the years as well is, um, you know, let me go back here, is the people who are on these committees, we refer to them as linchpins. In fact, there's a, Seth Godin wrote a whole book on this. And one of the things he talks about is the linchpin uh, folks on your team who you, they're irreplaceable. They have great knowledge, they have great expertise. They really know their job and what their people go through. So when you're building your safety committee, look for the linchpins. They know how to deal with complete complexity. They got a lot of knowledge in their area. <clears throat> These are special folks that you want to get involved. One last comment, Tim mentioned it. In this chapter, we talk about core values. And a lot of your organizations today have a set of core values. We would highly recommend that you evaluate those and look at them and say, is safety included? Correct. And there's an organization that we work with that we're very proud of that does great work. Tim, tell us a little bit about the story here. Well, Jay Becker, an associate electrical contractor, uh, really truly believes in core values. They, they stress, they work with them. But not only that, but they put together a program and an award program where each one of their core values has been uh, voted on by the workers, by the employees, and select one of their co-workers who best utilizes and emphasizes what that core value is. And as you can see in the pictures, these people are pretty proud of what they won. And the nice thing is, is that it's part of the team. It's, it's the associates that are working side by side that are voting on their other associates that say, hey, yes, you do have the commitment. You do follow the safety. You do have these elements of core values because the biggest difference is that core value is lock solid where priorities change. And so when we look at the core value part, I really looked at this level of commitment that Jay Brecker has done with their people and their associates to bring us to the highest level possible. It's awesome display of really following a, a winning playbook when it comes to building strong safety cultures. And so we're on the fourth C, which is about safety champions. And in it, we've talked about, you know, safety committees. We've talked about core values and what you can do there. And there's another C here, the fifth C, and that's costs. <coughs> Excuse me. So when it comes to costs, there's a lot to talk and unpack here. And when you look at the Liberty Mutual study that just came out mid last year, it hasn't changed much over the past three to four years. It's a billion dollars a week in injuries. Melissa, when you see this, give me a sense of what are some of the things that you're hearing from clients that they're wrestling with when it comes to the cost? Well, the increased costs of work comp <laughs> also go up. There's a worker shortage. So those are also some hidden costs. When there's an injury, how do you replace the person that was doing that work? <clears throat> it's just such a huge ripple down effect. And we have that ripple effect for the injury um, of who it affects personally, but how does it affect the company business sense wise? It, there's a lot beyond just the initial injury cost. Huge. So $58 billion a year. Tim, tell us a little bit about this slide. Let well, me see the investment side. Everybody asks, you know, please, what am I going to get from my safety? What, what, what's the benefit for me? Well, there's a lot of benefit yeah. as, we, as we see down there, but, you know, statistics show that if you invest a dollar into it, you're getting four to six dollars in return. And that return once in a while is, is not easy to see. But when you look at that big picture, it's less lost time. It's keeping your quality workers, better productivity. It's just the 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 view of your other companies that's looking to, hey, we want so and so to be on our site because they are safe. They do have a clean work record and things like that. Uh, you can put the dollars towards better things such as training and machine guarding and 
PPE, all that much. So that return on your investment is there. Unfortunately, we don't often put it on a profit and loss statement, which we uh, maybe need to do once in a while. You know, it's not uncommon sometimes for you as a safety leader, someone wants to change safety, to run into resistance from leadership, ownership, and you got to talk dollars and cents. Yep. And that's what essentially this helps you do is speak that financial language to show the business case. One thing I want to go back on, and that was that St. Cloud refrigeration, the key push person, the key linchpin on this was the CFO, chief financial officer. He saw the dollars and cents as well as the level of commitment to safety. Huge. Melissa, you were talking to me yesterday about this and the importance of this for some of our clients. It is huge. Um, we have a, a story, story I shared. We have a client that they're very proud. Uh, a couple of years ago, they were under one, which is the industry standard for their EMR. And he said, you know what? We pushed our team. We wanted to be under 0.75. Uh, and they are. As of recent, they're at 0.73 in a, a very... Um, I would say high injury rate industry where they could at any point uh, have something that could impact their EMR, but they work as, again, as a team that everyone's got each other's back. So everybody gets to go home safe at the end of the day. But I think Tim Peterson was sharing with us yesterday, the opposite side of this. Well, the other factor on this is industries that, that live and breathe and really have a high safety culture, they do not want other industries and other contractors and people in the facility that don't follow that. So this EMR is very, very, very important to look at. We've actually had, and I've talked to people that have not been able to even put a bid on a project because their EMR was over one, like 1.01. And the contractor, the company they were going to work for said, sorry, you're not safe and we don't want you on our site. So it's a, it's a cost of business, but it's also success of business of even being able to be part of what the industry is going on out there. So it's it's definitely a lot of benefits to reduce that. And so when they say, geez, what am I going to get back from having a great safety culture in a program? Well, your workers are safer, you have quality workers, but you're also be able to participate in job functions that maybe some people can't. Right on. So this, you know, being the fifth C about costs, we, we made it the fifth C because you know, there was talk of, we'll make it the first. That's what's most important to people. And, you know, the fact of the matter is, it's an outcome that happens when you really get the other C's in place ahead of that. And this is what we've seen time and time again with our clients. And so when you think about the five C's in a way to really impact your, your safety culture, these all fit together. And I love, again, that unofficial six C of the communication part as well. But we started earlier and we looked at 10 stories. We looked at 10 loss of life stories across the, the upper Midwest. It has a real impact on us. We see an opportunity to really make uh, inroads continue in years to come to help others, companies reduce that. Because we, we, we've been able to avoid so much of that with our clients when we really have the opportunity to work with them. But this is an inside out approach that we're talking. The fact that many of you took the initiative to sign up for this, we'd ask you to take a picture of this, uh, take a screenshot. And this is one of the many exercises that we include when we work with companies. We have a four hour um, workshop that goes through all of the chapters in depth and it's really interactive. We offer that to our clients or anyone else who's interested you can reach out to us if you'd like to discuss it more. We'll have our contact information. But one of the things we talk about is the inside out approach is it starts with you. And, you know, the old adage, if you point a finger at someone, you got three pointing back. Uh, while you may think that the problem is in someone else's department, a particular employees or whatever, what are the two or three things that you're going to do to become a better leader to strengthen your safety culture? We think that if you were listening today, there's probably a few things you could pick up right away that you could do. Make some notes, make a commitment. Nothing happens for many of us unless you write something down make the commitment to safety. And, um, you know, we can all accomplish this thing. And that is our goal. Let's get everybody home safe at night, night after night. Now we have some other important information we'd like to share with you um, and cover for upcoming events and some other things. Hey, Tim, before you jump yeah. out of that, I want to emphasize is if we started back with that 5,190 fatalities, that's that many families that didn't have dad, mom, brother, sister come home. Absolutely. But then if you look at the ripple effect 
of how many friends and distant relatives and co-workers that were also affected, that's huge. And when we take that and we take it seriously to the level of bringing a safety culture to where it's supposed to be, those numbers can, can disappear. Um, you can work each and every day without sending somebody, unfortunately, not home. Absolutely. So take a quick video, uh, video a quick vote here, if you could. Um, Justine's putting this up. We have three more things we want to cover with before we uh, let you go. If you can just give us some input on this content, this is how we get better. <clears throat> want to make sure we're hitting the mark for you. So as you're doing that, um, we'll also show you that uh, when I go to the next slide here, when we're ready to do that. Um, Justine, one of the things that we'll do is we'll put on the screen our contact information. So um, we'll end that and see if we can get that going here. Uh, okay. We're at 63%, Tim. Is that good? Do you want me to stop the poll now? Uh, yeah, so if you can participate in that as we do it, um, that would be good. Uh, I just want to advance the slide because I want to make sure that they have this as well. So uh let's see here there we go if you can take a picture of this like i said you may have some unique situations that's not going to work in a uh, text box to send us a message we'd love to give you free advice and that's what we're here for so if you want to call email any one of us hey here's what you're wrestling with at your company we can give you some advice along those lines we also wanted to tell you a couple other things that's going on with oecs here in the future uh melissa i'm going to turn this over to you Awesome. But this is just a quick reminder for those of you that need the CE credit, since this session is approved um, for a CE, please put your name uh, and email into the chat. We will follow up and send you out an evaluation survey that must be completed and returned to the email that it comes from. And once we receive that back, um, our staff will send out your certificate of completion for your CE. Absolutely. We also want to share a couple upcoming webinars with everybody. So next month, we'll be talking about the impact of legalized marijuana and THC edibles in the workplace, um, and especially when it comes to employer drug testing. And then in April, following up with being prepared if OSHA shows up at your door. A little bit back to how I tied in um, RAPID. They have everything in place. They hit all those five C's. Their complacent, um, excuse, excuse me, their compliance piece is in place. Um, so this could help companies be prepared coming up. What what might be they be missing, or what what kind of questions do they have? This is always a great interactive session um, when we talk about what do we do when OSHA shows up in your facility. So Melissa, just real quick in terms of uh, and that OSHA at the door is one of our best attended webinars. People really value that in terms of the stuff that they get from that. Can you tell us a little bit about who will be joining you for the uh, legalized marijuana? Yes, I have a an attorney, Tom Revenue, uh, will be joining us and he'll talk about it from the legal side of things. And this is going to be also interactive. So we would encourage people to use the chat uh, during this session to ask uh, company specific questions. And then again, as all of ours are, we have our follow-up and, you know, contact information. If you guys even have questions about ahead of time, you can certainly email myself and I can send those to Tom and he can prep them into his session. Awesome. So we just want to continue to give you as much great information as we can on a lot of different topics related to safety. Thank you for attending. And when, one last time, if you would like your copy of the book, you have my email. Let me know. We will get these mailed out to you uh, free of charge. We want to share the information and have a great rest of your day. Thanks for attending.